So I'm Eric Hodel, and I'm with the Seattle Ruby Brigade, and we're going to be talking about uh, several of our pet projects. Um, since I'm, uh, this is here is Ryan Davis, and we have Aaron Patterson, Phil Hagelberg, and in the back there is uh, JD. So uh, since I, I get to go first for some reason, so uh, here we go. Oh crap. There we go. No, I had it fine. <laughs> now you broke it. No, it won't. You unplugged it. Oops. Take no. these broken wings. No. <laughs> <laughs> Every Tuesday. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, my UPnP project. And so when I started this thing, I had this cool idea. And uh, it was, I want to easily be able to watch movies on my PlayStation 3 from my laptop. And you know, I had been using the um, MediaTube and some other things, and you had to go to all these different websites to go and figure out how to turn on transcoding, because not all of my videos were in the right format. And so you know, I thought this was a really cool idea that this could be automatic. And it's probably not as cool a, an idea as having a bath with a bunch of McDonald's hamburgers. But it's probably equally crazy. So I went and did some research. And I discovered that all of this is using the UPnP protocol. And uh, there's, some, there's four main components to this. The first is there are devices. So things like routers, uh, light switches are part of the protocol, and media server, which is what I was interested in. And on those devices, there are services that run. And so you've got, like, for the router, you can ask whether or not the internet is up. Uh, you can open a new port. Uh, for light switch, you can turn it on and off, see whether it's on. Um, for the media server, you can go and browse all the content and select what you want to watch. And then to discover these networks, or discover these devices on the network, there's a discovery protocol, which is similar to uh, Bonjour, which uses uh, multicast and uh, an HTTP-like protocol. And then to talk to the devices, there's a separate part of the protocol for control. So you can go and connect to the device, figure out what services it runs, and then what the methods on those services are. And this whole thing is built on top of SOAP. So it uses a, a description language similar to WSDL, but much, much simpler. So I took all this information and I decided, OK, we need to write a library for this. And so my, my, I had two, two major goals for it. And the first was for it to be as friendly as possible. So if you're going to create a device, you just say, OK, I need these two services, and then I'm done. And to set up a service, you say, well, uh, it has all these methods. These are the input and output parameters. And then you just implement them. So there's really no more setup to do. Everything else, I wanted to automate. So once you have the, the implementation, then you say, if you want to start it, you just say, OK, device go. And then it automatically says, OK, I need these services. It instantiates them, builds up a SOAP server, and advertises it on the network for you. And then if you want to control a device that you've already got on the network, you can say, use the discovery protocol to discover it, say, and it gives you a URL back. And you say, OK, take this URL, make me a control endpoint. And then it automatically goes and builds all the classes for you, fills them in with all the methods, and all that through SOAP. So that was pretty nice. And so eventually I got to the, uh, oh, sorry, got to the UPnP media server, which was my burger bath project, and uh, started to work on this stuff. And I found that the, the UPnP parts were actually pretty easy. So implementing the device stuff, the service stuff, the discovery stuff, uh, the SOAP stuff uh, I built on top of SOAP for R, which is uh, not well documented as far as the internals go. So that was pretty difficult. I had to go and dig through SOAP for R a lot to go and say, oh, so this is how WSDL does it, so I need to do something like that, and teasing parts out of the API. Uh, so in my media server, I'm still working on the transcoding library. Um, I've got a, a buddy uh, who released the FFmpeg Ruby gem on GitHub a couple, uh, about a month ago or so, um, whose name is Antonin Amond. And so we've been working back and forth on that. And it's actually kind of difficult because FFmpeg is, has all these great libraries for encoding and decoding, but all the glue code is written in the C binary. So we're having to port parts of that to Ruby. And there are still some pieces I want. Um, so 
uh, now that it, once I get transcoding working, I'll be able to do stuff like uh, go to YouTube or have YouTube served up via the media server, and you can go and watch YouTube videos. Um, I'd like to do Flickr as well, and that'll be you know so you can go and say, here's my Flickr user account. Um, I want to view my slideshows on my TV. Um, and so currently what I have working with the media server now is you can go ahead and browse images and it gives you the thumbnails and uh, it'll go and do the transcoding so like the PlayStation doesn't support TIFFs so it'll convert it to a JPEG so you can see it. Um, I'm using uh, one of the MP3 uh, uh, tag libraries to go and grab all the track info uh, so you can browse a list of MP3s and it'll show you artist and track length and genre and all that stuff. And if you have a video that is supported by your device, then those all work. So if, uh, if you've got a regular MPEG, then those will work on most devices. Um, the few thing, a few more things that I uh, want is the, for example, the Xbox requires a very specific layout of the top level directory. So I'd like for my software to automatically go and say, oh, you're an Xbox, I'll go and fix all that stuff up for you. And that's it for me, thank you. Uh, next is JD. Let me just get the audio plugged in. Right there. And make sure. We got the functions. We should hear the audio if I hit the. Uh, or do you have it on function? Um, they're not hooked up this one, so I don't know. We can go audio less if we have to. Oh. Hold down the function key. Perfect. Is that actually coming through? So we have audio out? Good? Okay, super. And then what do we do? Flip that. Beautiful. Okay. So this is really uh, the appendix to Greg Bornstein's uh, Arduino address yesterday. And you all know the rules to that because we got a couple demos. And when you do a demo, it's all O. Oh, so we have to do the practice. Ready, set, O. Oh. No. Okay. No, no. You'll get it better. So, <laughs> okay. So, other uh, thoughts on extending uh, extending the Rad DSL. And so, we all know Ruby. It's enjoyable. It made programming fun again. Productivity, efficiency. Why we chose Ruby. We all love power, and we love to extend it to things. Why not? We saw Greg do it yesterday, and so. I'm going to show you a little bit of my experience extending it and talk about that. There's only one problem, though. These things. Oh, wait, I'm up here. Okay, I'm out of sync here. So these things. These are these electronic manuals with about a million devices in them. And the first thing you do is try to do anything. You see these books, and it just is a complete turn off. But fortunately, timing is everything. And we have this make movement going on. And we have things like SparkFun, which essentially gives us curated electronics. So instead of a million things in these convoluted books, you get a thousand things or a hundred things that other people are working on so you can share notes and you can have some success. So you can get things like very, very cool RFID readers that are just plug them in and they work or little LEDs, actually three LEDs combined with a microprocessor on the back so you can put together an ambient orb just in an hour. Or a little switch like this, which is just the coolest switch. And so these are all curated electronics and it works great for open source hardware design. So we have the tools, we've got Ruby, we've got curated hardware. And so I had this interest in network devices. Everything's a device, it has a network address, it can all talk, and I really wanted to take and take my power meter and hook it up and do some fun stuff with it. So I said, well, how should I go about that? I should grab the Arduino, which you know about already. It's a little chip with a bunch of ports. And people are crazy about the Arduino. They build cakes on the Arduino. They do little bots that run on it. They wear it. Uh, it it's just crazy. It's written up and wired. It's got a lot of traction. And it's pretty exciting. So that's really the third element. Well. And here's the fourth element, Greg Bornstein's Ruby Arduino development. And so I grabbed it and I did Hello World. It worked right out of the box. And you've seen this little Hello World sketch. 
And I said, great, fabulous. Now I got to go drag up the servos from the basement. So I get the servos and I said, oh, it doesn't quite do that right out of the box. And so I set to work to get my servos to work, got distracted from my meter reading. And so <laughs> added, made some additions. Okay, so the first thing, smart pin declarations. So you could do, this is the hello world, actually. There we go. Okay, that's the hello world. And he said, well, we just want to take my button, and then when I call it a device button, I instantiate a bunch of um, basically a data structure, and I can keep the state of the button, so I can toggle them on and off, et cetera. And it just happens by saying device button. You can also get uh, some hysteresis in there that's baked in, so if you've got a debounce, it's already taken care of for you. Then, did the same thing for servos, set up a data structure, store the state of it, sign mins and max, all for free, and then continued on and did it for I2C, one wire, LCDs, you can just buy a SparkFun LCD, plug it in, and we know about it just by saying devices, SF underscore LCD, uh, EEPROM, and Ethernet. So we added more libraries, Brian Lott Riley was really key on pulling together libraries. And then we added some modular plugins for C code, a little bit more translation, more damn parentheses. Where are they? There they are. So this whole thing is based on Ruby to C, or a big component is based on Ruby to C by Eric and Ryan, and the parse tree. And so you have a lot of S expressions. And so this is just a little definition for a times function. So, but that's all hidden from you, so you don't need to worry about it. Let's see, so the result, here's the result. And there's some sound in a minute. So you see the, that's a little Arduino Nano, the servos, the three servos, some wine glasses, and it plays. Okay, so, so that's a wine glass, and then I went on to do other things. Uh, but first let's do some, uh, some quick demos. So I want to switch, this is a simple F RFID, and we're just going to show, this is not even using the Arduino, uh, is go ahead and flip the camera down, and Aaron's going to put on just a little RFID, RFID chip. Whoa. And we want to go right here. So it's kind of, so basically out of the box, you need to point down a little bit, right. There you go. And it doesn't, it reads the same number so it won't read again, it reads the same number so it won't read again. And that's just an example of not so much Arduino, it's just out of the box like 30 bucks and your RFID or D reading with serial out. It's, and I'm just feeding that from a serial out on the RFID reader, that little device right here, right to a serial in screen. I mean, there's, you've almost eliminated the electronics out of it. Okay, so let me go on to demo number two if we switch back to the screen. So, this is the Blink M Tower. I'll show you the video and I'll explain what it's about. Plug in the input, not output. I think you're right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah.
Okay, so let me just show you the live version of that really quick and show you what it's all about. So once again, it's these curated devices, a serial LCD, and you can actually just leave that out. We got it all started up, and so literally, it's. Have we got that? Are we? We want to get that guy right there. So it's basically these really cool resistive strips, and you touch them, and you can basically change the RGB, just it reads the resistance and then changes the RGB. On this, these are actually little I2C networked LEDs, three LEDs in one, and then you can do funky things like, let's see if I can get it there, you can chase them. You can do a color chase over a color chase, and if you take a look at the code on it, it's pretty darn simple. So if we shift back to this, So a lot of setups here, but basically you see two buttons, three sliders, an LCD, and at the top we're actually establishing our I2C. And we just call a device a spectra, and if it's a, it's a spectra strip and it knows that it's this fancy strip and can just deal with it. So the code's really straightforward and simple because it's basically built in. And then this is this little dance chase where it basically changes the RG, run, laps through the array of, RGB, of uh, LEDs, changes the RGB colors right there, and then changes them back. Super simple stuff. So, and this finally is the remote control book. So, this is using Zigbee, excuse me, and if you aim at the book here, there's the book right there, yeah, that's perfect. So, Aaron's gonna control via Zigbee on one Arduino right there, and he's gonna to talk to the book right there. Ready, one, two, three. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and then back to the slides. And once again, the code, super, super simple. I mean, we've got a loop. This is actually the code on both pieces. And we've got a loop. We send the message if we read the button, and at the same time it checks for a G. And if I got a G, I basically do an acknowledge, I do an acknowledge, and then I open the cover, bounce the cover, close the cover. Very basic stuff. Let's see. That's thank you very much, and just a couple of credits. Um, Ruby Forge. Uh, Rad is hosted at Ruby Forge, and there's a little bit of information in the Arduino at the second address. All right, uh, my name is Phil Heigelberg, and I'm, yeah, I'm from Seattle RB. Hey, um, at the last RubyConf, uh, there was some talk about you know Ruby and Lisp and how they're uh, very intertwined in their history, um, and. Uh, this was, I think, during Matt's Q&A, and Matt asked, uh, you know, how many people have implemented uh, Ruby, or sorry, how many people have implemented uh, Lisp on their own? And uh, it was something like six or seven percent of the hands went up, and that was awesome, but uh, I was very sad that my hand couldn't go up then, so I uh, started this project uh, called Bus Scheme, and that's what I will show to you right now. Um, let's see, okay. <laughs> It's so distracting. Okay. Um, let's go back to uh, Dvorak here. <laughs> kidding me? Okay. Um, so, everything you wanted to know about bus scheme. But actually this talk is only uh, 10 minutes long, so I had to change the title. Uh, so, we're talking about <laughs> that instead. <laughs> um, so, bus scheme is a scheme interpreter that is implemented uh, mostly on the bus. Not 100% anymore, um, but I do it on the commute to work. 
yeah, Ryan, uh, Ryan felt compelled to point out that it's not just on the bus. So, <laughs> Scheme is a Lisp, and Lisp is all about Lisp processing. Uh, and a list is, you know, it's uh, a list of things wrapped in parentheses. So that's kind of, you know, the thing you always hear about Lisp is that it's all about parentheses. Um, and that's because it's, it's all about lists. Lisp are the, lists are the most basic data type. So you see uh, Lisp list and the Ruby version of the same thing right down there. Um, so everyone talks about metaprogramming with Lisp, right? So um, when you talk about metaprogramming, number one thing is code is data. So um, what that means in Lisp is that the structure of the program is a list. Uh, well, this is actually true of Ruby, too, behind the scenes, right? This uh, function uh, method definition at the bottom there um, is actually turned into something kind of like this uh, behind the scenes before it gets interpreted. This is actually a little cleaned up from the real version, but uh, just for readability's sake. Um, so if you've ever used parse tree, you can kind of get at what's going on here. Or Rubinius's string to XP uh, will expose that to you. Um, but you don't want to really be working with that all the time. You don't want to write your code like that because, um, well, Ruby's not meant to do that. <laughs> but um, there are some advantages to that when you talk about code as data, right? Um, you know, you can, you can rewrite your code on the fly. You can inspect it. It's, it's first class. So Scheme's syntax is optimized for that. So that's essentially, this is the Ruby version and this is the Scheme version of the same function, really. Um, so you see uh, it's just a list of lists. So it's, it's basically the parse tree is right there and that's exactly what you end up writing. Um, so when you're evaluating these functions, uh, the first element of each list is considered the function and the rest of it is um, everything else in the list is an argument. Um, and each argument gets evaluated before it gets passed on. So this kind of convoluted thingy here is a, uh, a function a call that calls the plus function with all these other arguments. Numbers evaluate to themselves, but then these other uh, lists get evaluated because their function calls two. Uh, so times three, two gets evaluated to six and what have you. And then all those arguments get sent to the plus function and it returns 12. Uh, the semicolons are uh, comment syntax. So that's, that's it basically for uh, evaluation. So it's very simple. You can, you can learn it pretty quickly. Um, but if, you, if all you have is numbers, it's not that interesting. So uh, let's, uh, you know, you have strings just like in uh, Ruby and uh, you have symbols. Symbols are a little different from in Ruby because in Ruby a symbol is a literal. So like colon foo evaluates to colon foo. Um, in Lisp, uh, a symbol is just an identifier. Um, so it's what your parse tree is built up out of. Um, but if you evaluate just foo by itself, then it returns whatever foo is bound to. But um, you know, if you want to just get at the symbol itself, then uh, you have to quote it, which is uh, the first notation there is kind of the more literal notation, and the second one is a shorthand uh, for, so when you see quote foo, just think of colon foo in Ruby. Um, and that's not the right key, is it? <laughs> um, Functions are the building blocks of pretty much everything uh, in Lisp. So in Ruby, we have proc.new to create a, a new uh, anonymous function. And in, in Ruby, it's uh, the lambda function. Um, so you see those, those two are virtually the same there. Um, so when you want to you do an assignment, you, you do that with a define function. Um, so the, uh, you see there, we have the value 41 getting bound to the, the variable bus line. We have the string Northgate Transit Center bound to the uh, bus stop identifier. And the arguments get evaluated, so you know, in the last one, you actually end up with 22 as the transit time. Um, so because of this uh, property of functions being data, uh, you don't have a special, you don't need a special notation to define a function. You're really just attaching a literal function to an identifier. And that's what you see here with the Fibonacci function. Um, that lambda expression is just getting bound to fib. That's all there is to it. Um, so, so lambdas are closures just like they are in Ruby. Um, so if you define a lambda, it has access to the variables around it that 
that were in scope when it was defined, even if they're not in scope when it was called. So in this example, uh, x is bound to 1 and y is bound to 2. And because those are in scope, when the lambda is created, um, the lambda has access to them. So if you try to call x outside of that block, it's no longer in scope. Um, but if you try to call that function, adder, that we just defined, which is bound to that lambda expression there, uh, it still has access to uh, those x and y values. So that's, uh, you know, with Ruby, you get the same thing with, with blocks, and uh, that's kind of the, the Ruby version. Lisp version, Ruby version. Um, so x and y are only in scope during that function. Def, uh, give me adder. So uh, that's kind of the basics of Scheme, uh, like the actual Scheme programming language. But uh, with bus Scheme, I wanted to kind of experiment a little more. And uh, since it's the only, no, it's actually not the only Scheme interpreted in Ruby, uh, Koichi wrote one back in like 2002. But <laughs> um, I wanted to experiment with some more, uh, you know, some of the things that you don't always see in the Scheme world. So. Uh, whenever Scheme people go on the web, they always talk about these crazy continuation-based uh, servers, which are really awesome. But uh, you don't see a lot of uh, real functional programming type people understanding REST. So that's, that's the direction I wanted to take it. Um, so in bus scheme, you can def resource something. And this is, uh, this is just binding a string to a, a path. So if you visit it, in your browser, you just get that string back, which, you know, um, this is built on the Rack uh, web service uh, abstraction library. So you can, it, it uses Mongrel by default, it falls back to WebRick, and it kind of encapsulates all the weird things about handling HTTP requests that you shouldn't have to think about when you're just, uh, when you're just wanting to create a simple service, so. Um, that's not that interesting, right? So um, because lists are trees and HTML is, HTML documents are trees, they actually map pretty well onto each other. So you can see there we're defining that uh, real HTML path to uh, the resource that's defined by this, uh, this list. So um, <laughs> yeah, that uh, actually renders into, it compiles into XML on the fly using the builder library. Uh, and uh, the notation is just very uniform. Uh, you don't have any uh, special, you know, it's, it's like builder is for, uh, for Ruby where you don't have to think about the details of XML, you just build up a tree and the tree becomes HTML or XML. So, but that's still static, so still not that interesting. Um, to really get dynamic, you want to bind a lambda to a uh, to a yeah a path on your web server. So, um, the first one just returns basically time dot now as a string, and the second one uh, will yeah it'll uh, return the Fibonacci sequence number of whatever uh, query string you pass it. So. Um, just a little uh, little taste of scheme on the web for you. Um, so I think, do I have time for a short demo? Or are we cutting it kind of close? OK. Um, in that case, you can uh, grab it. It's a gem. Uh, it's up on GitHub. And these slides should be up there in an hour or so. They're not quite yet. <laughs> and there's a tutorial up there for uh, if you want to go a little further into uh, what bus scheme does. So plan on working on polishing the web functionality a little more. Right now it's a pretty thin layer around Rack, so I wanna, I wanna make it a little more natural. Um, I'm working on macros to get syntactic extensions, but it's still, uh, still in progress. And at some point, continuations, inline Ruby, really cool things like that. So uh, yeah, that's bus scheme, thanks. Hello, my name is Ryan Davis. Um, so what I want to talk to you today is a, a bit darker topic than, than the other people up here. 
Um, basically, I want to talk about being a Ruby sadist. I've talked about this a little bit before. Um, basically, that it's, it's been my, my theme for the year that I like to hurt code. <laughs> a lot. Um, basically, we are seeing um, a new era in Ruby where we're finally getting the language tools that we need to really have a transformational experience with our code. Um, so if we talk about the philosophy of Ruby sadism, the basics are people will press charges if you hurt them, but code won't. So top your code, make the code your bitch, and beat it in submission. That's a, a lot easier uh, and you get to keep your job. So Ruby sadism I define as deriving pleasure from inflicting pain on software, especially bad software, but really all software as a candidate. Uh, and we have a bunch of tools to do this with, um, and you're familiar with some of them, and you use some of them, I hope. Um, and if you don't, we have to have a talk. Um, one of them is auto test, and it's really it's the howitzer of, of testing. Um, and a lot of you use it already. It's it's truly a sadistic tool in that it's constantly beating on your code with your tests. And if we haven't seen it before, we can get a quick little demo here. So we make a modification and save, and it automatically runs the relevant tests, which fails. When you change it back so that it's no longer going to flunk, it passes and then it reruns all the tests to make sure you didn't break anything else. You know, it's a really simple idea that when we brought to the table, we didn't realize how much it was going to change the way we do our work. We have another tool called Heckle. It helps make your test cry. Uh, and the basic idea behind it is that once your tests all pass, we're going to go on the fly in runtime, modify part of your implementation and run your tests again. If your tests don't fail then, you've done something wrong and you're not covering everything. So let's see a little demo of that. Uh, we have def is awesome and it is small for a reason. Def is awesome, exif uh, add awesome, and your tests all pass, and that's great. So Heckle's going to go and modify that so that the if is morphed to an unless. Now, obviously, by running the same test, you're going through a different code path, and you should fail. But if it passes, you've done something very, very bad, and you know that you need to go in and get better test coverage. Another tool, slightly newer, is Flog because beatings build character. What it does is it goes and analyzes your code at the AST level for various kinds of complexity, assignments, branches, and calls. And it gives weight to certain things in different ways. So here we see a, a very stupid example um, where we've got an eval and some equality checks and a conditional and puts and it scores all that up as 11.2 and gives you uh, a detailed reason why it's scored that way. Now the actual numbers, and, and this is something that, that people are, are finally beginning to catch on, the actual numbers themselves are meaningless absolutely, but relative to each other they're very, very important. Whatever's boiling up to the top of your report is what you should be looking at. The stuff at the bottom of the report is not as important. Relative numbers are important, but you can't use these to compare your project to someone else's. It just doesn't make any sense that way, absolutely. And the new kid released here at RubyConf is Flay. I have a harder time describing what Flay does. It uses the AST to, to find structural similarities. And here we see some, some real code that I went over. It's a, an incredibly complex piece of Ruby that I found while um, flogging a bunch of code that I used for, for testing my parser. Um, so here we see uh, a simple Flay on it. And the, the thing that boils up at the top are these four whens that it found that look the same. Now let's go look at them. Now you don't actually have to read the code on the next page because quite frankly it's painful. That's one of the whens. It's 21 lines long. It's really complex. But that's the next one. Ooh, it didn't line up right. Damn it. It didn't line up right. But if it did line up right, you'd see that three words are changing. Just three. There. Those line up better. That's it. So this is a really, really simple candidate for refactoring. You refactor this when into a method call that takes two function names. You do sends instead of the function calls, and you're done. You've, you've, uh, you've cleaned up your, your code quite a bit. And then you move on to the next one and the next one. That's what Flay does. I'm going to go nice and fast so you don't have any problems. 
with yours. Um, and then last um, but not least, just for fun, I wanted to show some shiny shit. This is something that I presented at 2005, but it has since been forgotten because I don't think anyone's touched it. So you've seen Parse Tree, and you've played with Parse Tree probably to some extent or indirectly. And you've probably heard of Ruby to Ruby. You may have heard of Ruby Inline. Um, that allows us to embed C code or, or any foreign language code into Ruby and compile it and run it on the fly. You might not have heard of Ruby to C. That's another thing that we wrote. Um, it was mentioned in, in the talk about RAD. Um, we also have a code profiler. So what happens when you take all of those things and put them together? A profiler plus parse tree plus Ruby to C plus Ruby inline. Well, here we see uh, 500,000 iterations on factorial in plain MRI. That takes 4.39 seconds. If we run the same code again with Zen Optimize, we trip a threshold, it automatically convert it to C, take that C and put it in an inline, have it compiled, linked, and brought back in, and replacing the method as it's running, and boom, we hit 1.4 seconds instead. And I think that's pretty rad, although it's not actually that usable for most things unless you use fib a lot in your business. <laughs> So that's all I have. Thank you. Hello, my name is Aaron Patterson. I am a Seattle R member, RB member and internet expert. And I want to be the first to welcome you to RubyConf 2008, or what I like to call the International House of Nerds. I have 106 slides and only 10 minutes to do it, so I'm going to speak quickly. I'm going to talk about Nokogiri and the history of Seattle RB. Uh, Nokogiri is a gem I recent re recently released. It is an HTML, XML, XSLT, I1234567789 compatible, XPath compatible, CSS3 parser thing. So you can parse your HTML and slice it up using XPath and CSS selectors if you like. And it is internationalized, as you can see. <laughs> um, Nokogiri sits on top of libxml2. Lib and the reason I chose libxml2 is because it is fast, it is standards compliant, it is popular, well supported, and dry. Oh. I kind of want to explain dry a little bit. Um, I wanted to use libxml2 because it already has an HTML parser, so why would I write my own? Here's an example of the usage. It's very easy. You just open, read something, tell it you want to search via CSS selector, um, iterate over all the nodes, and you're done. You may ask yourself, how did I get that CSS selector? Um, I loaded this web page, opened up Firebug, inspected their logo, copied the um, selector from Firebug, and then used it in my codes. So I'm going to talk about those little bullet points a little bit. Speed. Let's look at some numbers. First, I want to say I love HPercot. I love HPercot so much that I stole its API. And I sat the API on top of libxml2, because why not? So before we show off these benchmarks, I want to show you a little bit of code just so you can see how similar they are. The uh, top two lines are using regular currently released HPercot. Well, the top line is regular currently released HPercot. The second line is HPercot 2. The third line is my compatibility layer for things which I don't think work quite right. And the fourth line is incompatible, but you'll see how compatible that is. Now, these are all the methods being tested, and as you can see, they're very, very similar. And that is because I stole HPercot's API. You should be able to get away with using the incompatible layer unless you're doing something wrong. Here are the speeds. The most important one to look at is the real time. As you can see, the compatible layer is a little bit slower than HPercot 2. But the incompatible layer, which should work most of the time for most of your use cases, is much faster. Here is more numbers. Look at the red. You can see XPath searching is insanely faster using libxml. 
CSS searching is slightly faster using the incompatible layer. And I kind of want to zoom in on this one because um, HPercot is so slow on this, it kind of makes the graphs look strange. Actually, that's not true. I didn't want to show that one. HTML parsing is the one I wanted to show you. So HTML parsing, this is just parsing a document, parsing slash dot. Um, HPercot 2 versus Nokugiri. I zoom in on this one and it's about two seconds faster in this particular test, so they're pretty close. XPath, um, you see no numbers in HPercot 2 because it just fails. It does not work and Nokugiri is faster. Same thing with this particular selector, this selector. Every benchmark is faster using the non-compatible mode. If you'd like to check my numbers, you can check out the gist from here. Next thing I want to talk about is standards compliance. Um, I use libxml's XPath parser and it deals with all of that. I don't deal with any of it. It's only libxml. CSS selectors. I've written my own CSS parser and tokenizer, but I stole the ones from W3C. So all of my parsers and tokenizers are generated. Um, specificity is your friend. Does everyone see this HTML document? Does everyone know what that style tag does? It turns that text red. Awesome, right? Can anyone tell me what this returns in HPercot? Probably not fail. And the reason is because it's ambiguous. HPercot mixes CSS selectors and XPath selectors in the same query. It's actually treating that as an XPath query. In XPath this means give me all P tags who have a child tag with A. In CSS it means give me a P tag who has a member attribute of A. So in Nokugiri I make you specify that. Don't trust me, trust the specs. Popular. I would venture to say that libxml2 is used by more people than use Ruby. Well supported. I read your bugs. Gem install Nokugiri. Try it out, please. Okay. Now on to the fun part. <laughs> History of Seattle RB starring me. <laughs> The year was Ruby 167. <laughs> the place was Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Three people. <laughs> Eric Hodel, Pat Eiler, <laughs> and Ryan Davis. <laughs> now, the first... <laughs> The first, uh, the first meeting was arranged via email and I wanted to take a few excerpts of the emails. Um, <laughs> the first is a story of misconnections. Ryan Davis says, I'm terribly sorry. And it's because he missed Pat Eiler. They, they missed each other. And Pat says, arg, because they missed each other. So the first Seattle RB meeting was a fail. Then, a connection of love. <laughs> Eric Hodel writes into the list, I've written a web page in Ruby in my spare time, and Ryan says, cool, welcome. <laughs> Eric, I love you. What? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> and that's how they first met. <laughs> the first meeting, another dramatic reenactment starring me. First is introductions. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm Ryan. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. <laughs> Next was some common ground building.
So, then came the first codes. <laughs> Those are nice codes. Ryan likes codes too. <laughs> then, the year, Ruby 182, Seattle's first gem, released by Eric Hodel. Ruby Growl, yes, he has gem. The year was Ruby 183, set 16 gems released, including Parse Tree, Ruby Inline, and I want to give a few stats. Seattle RB, before November 1st, has 90 unique gems. It's probably more now. It is more now. 399 total gem releases before November 1st. It is more now. Here's a graph of our gem releasing, which if you want to run these codes, you can get them here. Seattle RB was the first Ruby Brigade ever. And I want to end with one more thing. The year was Ruby 185. 79 gems, or, or one eight, yeah, 185, 79 gems released. And the thing that all of you don't know is that Ryan didn't used to be angry. <laughs> As you can see from this photo. Photo evidence of Ryan not angry. Tuesday night, 6.55 p.m. I showed up. 7 p.m., 7 p.m., 7.05 p.m. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the end.